Welcome to The Lawyer's Podcast, a series of conversations about law practice. Each week, we talk with legal entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. And now, here are your hosts. Hi, I'm Sam Glover. And I'm Aaron Street, and this is episode 243 of the Lawyerist Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're talking with Ran Fishkin about audiences, attention, and SEO. I love Ran Fishkin. <laughs> it was a good conversation. I'm so excited. Yeah. Today's podcast is brought to you by Back Office Betty's Text Expander, Ruby Receptionists, and Podium. We wouldn't be able to do this show without their support. Stay tuned, please. We'll tell you more about them later on. This week on Lawyerist is budgeting week, and we've got some great new content on the website, videos and blog posts and resource pages all about law firm budgeting. And we even have a new free downloadable budget template in the Lawyerist Insider Library for those of you who either are or want to become free Lawyerist Insiders. It's worth pointing out that the entire library is new. This is a good point that we should yeah. probably point out right like now if you are already an insider or if you joined to download a free thing at some point as of late last week it is an entirely new library with brand new templates and resources and downloads built around the chapter topics in the small firm roadmap and so if you haven't been there in a while you should absolutely check it out it's prettier and it's full of really valuable stuff including the budget template now we've got a brief sponsored conversation with emily larouche from back office betty's and then my conversation with rand fishkin I'm Emily LaRouche. I'm the founder and CEO of Back Office Betty's. We provide virtual receptionist services for law firms across the U.S. and Canada. Hi, Emily. Welcome back to the podcast. So Back Office Betty's is a virtual receptionist, which means it's something that firms can plug into their client intake process. And you talk about that in terms of process design. What do you mean by that? What is process design? Process design is extremely important. And I feel like everything in the business should have a process to it. So part of the designing of the process is I follow kind of a simple three-step format. So step number one is you figure out what you want to accomplish. So what is the end game? Step number two is pick a strategy on how we plan on getting there. And then step number three is we want to make sure we back into it. So you kind of start with the end and work backwards. And along the way, we want to make sure that we can accomplish the process while doing it profitably and making sure the business stays healthy. Gotcha. And so how do you start thinking about process design in a firm or in your work, whatever it is? I think you're going to find in every company, there's some people who are really in the weeds. They're great detail people. And then you have people who are more high level. So I always recommend find those people who are more high level. You know, the ones who annoy you because they forgot to dot the I and cross the T. Hmm. Those are the best people for your process designers. And then you get the detailed people to fill in kind of the meat of the material. So start with someone who can really see what the end game is and figure out what do we want to accomplish with this? And then kind of backfill it and work with your detail people to fill in how we're going to do that. How do you decide what your strategy is going to be with this process? Picking a strategy might mean what kind of tools are we going to use? Can we use something that's a free tool? Do we have to purchase a paid tool? How are we going to kind of use the strategy of making this happen. Gotcha. And how do you make sure that you're doing this in a profitable way? right? That has to be one of the considerations too. So for us, a perfect example is when we're designing an intake process, we know our clients have a certain threshold of what they're willing to pay for. So we know we have to keep the call to a certain time period so that we're not overcharging. So for an attorney, you're going to want to do the same thing and look at how much time is this going to take me? Am I overcomplicating things? How can I keep it very simple so that I ensure that I'm not overcharging my customer, but I'm also effectively using my time in a way that's profitable. Do you have any tips for avoiding overcomplicating things? That does seem to come up a lot when people start digging into processes. They get stuck in the process of figuring out their process and designing it. Absolutely. So my biggest tip is find that person, again, who's a little bit annoying because they miss details. They are the best 
process designer because they're going to do the high level stuff and they're going to figure out how to accomplish what you need to accomplish without getting lost in the weeds. As someone who does design, this is something that I end up doing with Aaron a lot, right? Aaron is the big picture. He says, I don't care about the tools. Here is what needs to happen, which is helpful to bring me back to, yep, I'll figure out how to make that happen. Yeah. So it definitely helps to have a partner where you guys are kind of the yin and yang for each other. Mm -hmm. And I have a partner like that, that I work with a lot. And I always tell her, you are the yin to my yang because everything <laughs> I miss, she catches. And so it works out perfectly. Very cool. Listeners, if you'd like to learn more, you can visit backofficebetties.com slash swipe. And there you'll get a free template with the top three intake processes that Back Office Betty's has designed. And you can plug those right into your firm, into your intake process. Emily, thanks so much for being with us again today. My pleasure. Take care. Howdy, gang. I'm Rand Fishkin, the founder of Spark Toro and previously Moz and the author of Lost and Founder. I'm excited to be joining the Lawyers Podcast today. Hey, Rand. Thanks so much for being with us today. You're one of those guests where you introduce yourself briefly, which I've asked you to do, but there's so much in those things. <laughs> so <laughs> do you mind starting at Moz and just kind of summing up what that is and what that means and where the company sits now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I dropped out of college in uh, 2001 and started working with my mom, Jillian. She had been running a graphic design and sort of small business marketing firm as a solo entrepreneur, like many attorneys do, mm -hmm. here in the Seattle, Washington area. And her clients started needing websites, right? The, the internet was growing and the web was starting to be a place where people needed to do marketing. And so... I liked building websites and I, I joined her to do that full time. And we struggled for a long time, but eventually sort of found our groove with SEO, yeah. search engine optimization. So essentially, that's the practice of you know improving your website and your online reputation and the links that point to you and the words and phrases that you use and the content you create in order to drive high value traffic from Google and other search engines. Back in the early 2000s, there were many search engines. Today, Google is 95% of the US market. I was going to ask you how to explain SEO strategy to a third grader, but I think you've just given us that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically, you know, billions of people around the world type in many billions of searches every day. And Google determines what results come up, right? They have a they have a ranking system that determines what results come up. And if you can come up for certain terms and phrases, uh, you can drive incredibly high value targeted traffic to your website that will often turn into customers for you. And and because of this, you know, incredibly high value transactional relationship that Google has with people searching the web all over the world, search advertising has become a huge market, right? This is why Google is one of the world's largest, richest, most powerful companies, and and the organic side of that, right, which is what SEO focuses on, search engine optimization focuses on the non-paid or what we call organic results, those get 11 times as many clicks as the paid results in aggregate. You know, for every 10 searches that result in a paid click, there are 110 searches that result in an organic click, a non-paid click. That's what Moz focused on. Initially, we were a consultancy, you know, services business, and then we transitioned to software and built tools and, and a, a platform to help people do this themselves, right? Either for their clients or for their own websites. Moz grew to, gosh, I think it's what, $55 million a year company right around there with you know 30,000 plus customers and a team of a couple hundred people, mostly here in Seattle, Washington and Vancouver, British Columbia. And I, I stepped down from the CEO role there, what, about four years ago, four or five years ago, and was at Moz until last year and then left to start this new company, Spark Toro. And, and, and at the end of that tenure, I wrote this book, Lost and Founder, that kind of details the long, uh, sometimes very uncomfortable journey of, you know, raising venture capital, trying to grow mm -hmm. a, a company. And yeah, it's kind of a warts and all look at the process and challenges that, that go into that. So, and I definitely want to talk about all of those things. And just, I guess maybe I should throw this in as a disclaimer that Lawyerist is a Moz customer and will be a SparkToro oh, cool. customer as soon as you approve our, <laughs> our application. Oh, yeah, it, it, 
<laughs> All right. Actually, you, you're in the uh, in the beta survey. I, I'll, I'll go in there and make sure. Hey, no rush. We're good. But I should probably throw that out there as a disclaimer. But one of the questions before we leave SEO entirely, I feel like there's still very much a bit of tension between people who are bought into SEO and working on it and people who are like, screw that noise. I don't play games. Mm -hmm. I just want to yeah. make good things. As someone who's been neck eyeball deep in this for a very long time, <laughs> how do you address that kind of distinction or that conflict? I think that like many forms of marketing, there's a philosophical understanding that I think, you know, reasonable people can even disagree on. Right? Mm -hmm. I think there's a sort of idealistic worldview, which is if I create a great product, I shouldn't have to tell anyone about it. People should just come to me. Right. right. And and any effort to tell anyone about my product or to try and get other people to cover it and amplify it and broadcast it, any effort to do that is manipulation. And I don't want to have any part in that. I mean, that sounds like lawyers attitude towards advertising in a nutshell, actually. Sure. Historically. Yeah. And I, look, <laughs> yeah. Hey, I think if that is your philosophical approach, right, if you believe that it's unethical to, you know, ask your client to uh, tell their friends if they have a good experience or mm -hmm. to leave you a nice review or, you know, to go to an event and speak at a conference to broadcast, you know, sort of your expertise or to, you know, advertise, yeah, any anywhere. Uh, if you think those things are fundamentally unethical and against, you know, your sort of moral core, SEO is definitely not going to be for you. Yeah. Right. That's not, <laughs> it, it, it is a marketing practice. Absolutely. I, I don't believe this at all. Right. I think that I think that value, massive amounts of value are created when people who do good work broadcast and amplify that work in ways that reach their audience and that help them drive value for those folks, right? If you are the best criminal defense attorney in Pittsburgh, I really hope that you are helping people who the criminal justice system has has treated wrong, I hope that you are attracting those people to your practice. I hope that you are doing great work for them. I hope that you are giving them, you know, the fair shake that that potentially American justice system is not giving them. That's what I want, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I want as a citizen. That's what I want as a, you know, fan, a hopeful idealist about how our justice system could work. But I also understand that there are people who feel differently. So you're comfortable just saying, you know what, here's the deal. Um, and if you're not into it, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally, right, in a in a capitalist society that's as advanced as ours is, I think it's, I don't want to be derogatory, but I think it's somewhat sticking your head in the sand to say, <laughs> I shouldn't have to tell anyone that I exist. Yeah. I find myself wanting to be that person. And then my business partner, Aaron Street, is the realist who's like, no, look, man, Google is trying to help people find what they're looking for. And we want them to find our stuff. And so we have to make sure that Google's imperfect search engine algorithms and computers can find our stuff and index it and understand it so that it can lead people to it. That's absolutely, absolutely correct, right? I mean, Google's systems are a layer on top of a pre-existing society, right? They're not creating their own idealistic machine world. Right. They are fundamentally looking at all the signals of brand and competency and signals of popularity and importance and referenceability. And they're trying to find, you know, the folks who have the expertise, authority, trust, right, and brand to put in the top of the search results. And as a business owner, it's your option. Right? It's your option whether you want to amplify those things and do them the, the way that Google sort of needs or whether you want to ignore those and hope that Google kind of eventually figures it out on their own and that other people who are good at that don't take your position. Mm -hmm. It would be awfully tempting while I have you on to go down the rabbit hole of SEO but I think what I'm just going to do is tell people who are interested to go and watch your Whiteboard Friday videos on YouTube. Because oh, yeah, I think sure. that's probably the best place to just dive in and get an overview and check out your excellent mustache. So. <laughs> 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 Thank goodness that's gone now. Oh, <laughs> man, that was a rough period. So if you're interested in diving down the rabbit hole, just go check out Rand's Whiteboard Fridays. We'll throw a link to the playlist in there. What is the status of your mustache at the moment? I mean, these days it is neat and short, and I can wear it even on humid days and not have to worry <laughs> about it <laughs> looking ridiculous. Fantastic. I'm very happy for that. Yeah, yeah, that that ridiculous mustache. I think I, you know, I wrote about it a little in Lost and Founder. That was basically a dare that I made to my team. Right. I said, um, a bet I will, 
get the company back to profitability. And until I do, I won't shave. Gotcha. You know, I'm not going to shave my mustache. And uh, and so I ended up with this, you know, ridiculous sort of 1920s waxed um, <laughs> you know, cur- thing that curled up on the sides. And that lasted for a much longer period than I intended, because when I stepped down as CEO and promoted my chief operating officer to the role, she turned out to be less interested in profitability than I was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. There you go. Well, we need to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors and we come back, we're going to pivot to talk about Lost and Founder and what you learned about being an entrepreneur. And then we'll close by talking more about SparkToro and how it's different and another way of flipping SEO upside down. So we'll be back in a minute. Drip, drip, drip. Hear that? It's your office's online reviews. Kind of slow, huh? Not exactly the gush of praise you were hoping for when you set up your account on that review site. But why? After all, your best clients love you. They say it all the time, just not online. And that's too bad. Because your word may be your bond, but your client's words, well, they're your best sales tool. And these days, a star rating can make the difference between very interested and running for the hills. Podium knows how important reviews are to your law office. That's why they built a great online review platform, making it simpler than ever to get a five-star rating you know you deserve. Businesses see an average 6% increase in revenue from reviews thanks to Podium. More than just a friendly reminder, Podium sends clients straight to the review sites you care about most with built-in analytics to monitor your progress towards meeting your next goal. So you could keep waiting for reviews to drip in, or you could open the floodgates with Podium. Just visit podium.com slash lawyerist to save 10% when you sign up. That's podium.com slash lawyerist to get started and save 10%. Podium, become the number one law office online. Unlock your productivity with Text Expander. Easily insert text snippets in any application from a library of content created by you and your team while reducing errors. You can save so much time, it's like getting an extra employee. Text Expander is available for Mac, Windows, iPhone, and iPad, and Chrome. Show listeners get 20% off their first year. Visit textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more about Text Expander. There's more to answering a phone call than just pronouncing your name correctly. And I think that's what sets Ruby apart from all the other receptionist services out there. I've been lucky enough to meet a lot of people who work at Ruby, and from top to bottom, it's full of the kind of people you'd love to spend time with. I guess it's something in the coffee they serve. And after all, when someone calls your firm, that means they are going to be spending time with your receptionist. You may think you get to make a first impression when you pick up the phone, but that's not how it works. Maybe your receptionist is just on the call for a minute or two, but that's all it takes to form a first impression. So it's a good idea to make sure your receptionist is the kind of person you'd want your callers to spend time with. It could be the difference between a big case and a big fail. Don't worry, Ruby can handle pronouncing your name right. They'll also help you make a great first impression. And now Ruby can even help you connect with clients right on your website with 24-7 live online chat. You can find out more about Ruby receptionists and how to make a great first impression at callruby.com slash lawyeristpod. Okay, we're back. So Rand, I guess not to spoil anything, but Moz was a rocky ride for you. And your book Lost and Founder is kind of both reflective and a lessons learned work about that. Absolutely. There are a number of takeaways and obviously people should just go read the book. But one of the things that struck me is Moz was a venture backed company. I think that is one of the things that caused a lot of problems for you. And when I'm thinking about all of the discussions about innovation in the legal world and elsewhere, people love to use examples of Facebook and Google and Apple and Amazon and Uber as examples of how businesses ought to be run. But those are all venture-backed companies and most small firms, most small businesses are basically bootstrapped. And I'm wondering how we should filter what we hear about best practices when it's a venture-backed company. It's a big question, I know, but maybe we can start taking it apart. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't think there's nothing to learn as a bootstrapped entrepreneur from Mm -hmm you know, venture-backed or institutional capital-backed organizations. But I, I'm not sure I would, I mean, I probably would try to avoid the lessons that Uber has taught us, right? <laughs> right. Unless what you're looking to do is use, you know, billions of Saudi dollars to sort of fund a non-profitable will eventually make up for it with self-driving cars Mm -hmm. business. That's a very strange one to me. I think, you know, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Google, they they have lessons that we can learn, but I think they're very, very difficult to extract, particularly because those companies are so big. They have so many institutional advantages. Their challenges are so different from what a bootstrapped entrepreneur faces. I, I don't feel like there's a tremendous amount that you can directly learn and take away, right? If somebody says, hey, this is how we did, you know, product planning meetings in Google and you and the four attorneys in your practice sort of look and go, Hmm. oh, okay, well, maybe we should do product planning that way. No, you you probably shouldn't. (laughs) That probably is tremendous 
tremendous overkill. The products that you are creating are essentially, you know, trying to figure out how to package your services, which is which is kind of a packaging as a form of, of marketing, right? And how to charge for them and bill for them and you know, how to uh, assign the work and all those kinds of things. But a Google-like process is going to be almost certainly overkill. They've got way more money. They've got way more people. There's just so much more that they can, maybe they even need to bring to it. I don't know. And as an attorney, right, uh, fundamentally what you're doing is serving individuals. Google is not serving individuals, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, Google is serving billions of people. And so the products that they build have to be accessible to, marketable to, usable by billions of people. And that is a fundamentally different challenge than how do I craft something that, you know, my next 70 clients over the next, you know, whatever it is, a year, two years, four years are going to appreciate and enjoy and get value from and, you know, take away great service from and, want to refer their friends and, you know, it's going to be able to practice that I'm proud of, just completely different in every way. And so I think that on the innovation front, there's probably a lot more to be learned from small businesses on the technological innovation side to be learned from early stage companies, maybe those that have just gotten funding or maybe those that are seeking funding or those who have stayed small and built remarkable practices. I think that's a far better target for who do we learn from. In your takeaway, in Lost and Founder, it was clear that you were wrestling with, that you have wrestled with some of these issues around like, you know, in what ways would taking capital influence my options and my ability to make decisions and to feel good about the product I'm building and work with people I want to work with? How does culture and values play into this? I, I feel like I could see you wrestling with a lot of those issues. And sometimes they're due to, I suppose, the way you take funding. But it feels like, you know, when you look at a Facebook or a Google, there's this story that they're trying to tell to investors or to advertisers and customers that are pretty influenced by those things as well. Yeah, totally agree. Another piece of loss and founder was you just being very open and vulnerable and honest about all of the downsides to being an entrepreneur and in a startup and trying to make that work. What what do you think makes it so hard to be an entrepreneur? Another big open-ended question, but I'm curious to hear what you say. Yeah, I think that when you are a, I don't want to say a cog in the machine, right? But when you are an employee and you are one of many there is a, a sort of shared roadmap, right, that everyone experiences. They all they all work for someone. They're all working towards something that's defined by leadership. They're working in a culture that's been defined by the founders, the creators of whatever organization they're in. If you go that level up, it becomes very, very much a, a solo or a project that you are doing entirely with your co-founders. Mm -hmm. You know, your other partners in, in a law firm often. Uh, and that means that everything needs to be defined by you. It also means that you are fundamentally at the core responsible for everything. <laughs> everything is your fault. <laughs> everything is your fault. Mm -hmm. I think I have evolved my thinking on this, right? So what I what I used to believe was that not only was everything uh, ultimately my fault and responsibility, but that it was also uh, within my power completely to change all of these things, mm -hmm. right? That everything here could be optimized. That the only reason Moz wasn't, you know, Google or Amazon or Apple was that I wasn't doing a good enough job, yeah. right? And that if I could figure out the right things to do, that we could be in those spaces. And to be honest, I think that's sort of an immature attitude, <laughs> right? It's an attitude that's grounded in, you know, the traditional sort of, well, I'm, a, you know, an American male in my early 20s, and I think I can do anything. And, you know, I believe all the hype about the venture backed world. And as you get older, right, I think you, you realize that's that's not the case. Right, that you have a tremendous amount of freedom and leeway, and you can absolutely influence the direction of your company, but the forces of the market and the world and uh, your environment are also big factors in that. And you do not fundamentally control your employees like you might control the, you know, switches on a railway. And the luck, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think holding yourself to that responsibility. Yeah. Whenever I hear people talking about what works and what they've done awesome and how everybody else should follow it, I'm like, yeah, but for every company that did what you said and succeeded, there are probably nine mm -hmm. or 20 that did exactly what you said and failed. And so right. it's one thing to say you can't lay all this stuff at your feet as a founder or anything else, but it's another thing to just disclaim it entirely. And there's somewhere in the middle where the right combination of luck and it's my fault and it's my success and it, it all kind of 
evens yeah. out. And, and if you, if you nail it all across the board, then you win, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a hundred, I'm a hundred percent certain that the absolute best, smartest, most thoughtful, creative entrepreneurs in the world almost certainly are not running the best businesses in the world or the mm-hmm. businesses that we look up to the mm-hmm. most. Right. And that's just because of, you know, opportunity and, and where they were born and who they are and what businesses they chose to enter versus, you know, what the market sort of geared toward and all the systemic advantages that history provides to particular things and just, you know, a million things that are outside of your control. And so what is in your control is what you can do about each of the challenges that come up, mm-hmm. right? That I think is a great place to hold yourself responsible. Like, hey, here's an opportunity. How can I best execute on that opportunity? Hey, here's a, a person who's not working out in my organization. What is the right thing to do? Should I train them and work with them? Should I let them go? Should I find someone else? Should I try and build a company that doesn't need someone like this in this role? Should I outsource it? You know, Should I move this person to another part of the organization? I think these are all very reasonable things that we can hold ourselves accountable for, but I'm not Amazon. Mm. <laughs> Let's probably take that one off the table. Like from day to day, from week to week, though, how do you keep yourself out of that mindset of this is all my fault or it's, you know, the reason we're not successful is on me? Do you have any tools that you yeah. use to keep yourself healthy, your mind healthy? I mean, what's interesting is if you read Lost and Founder, you'll see, you'll find a couple of chapters yeah. in there where I obviously did not, right? <laughs> where I obviously was lost, completely mm-hmm. lost in the world of this is all my fault. I'm not doing it right. You know, this, this company, it's not failing, right? But it's, it's failing as a venture back business, meaning its growth rate went from 100% year over year to 50% year over year, right? That was, mm-hmm. that was essentially when I felt like I was failing. That was when I stepped down as CEO. And that's relatively ridiculous. But in the context of what a venture backed startup is supposed to do, hopefully it's, it's somewhat understandable. Right. I think these days, the things that have helped me the most, I know this is going to sound somewhat shallow, but uh, getting enough sleep. <laughs> Doesn't sound shallow at all, actually. I mean, it, seems, it, it sounds too simple. Mm-hmm. I think it sounds overly simple, but it is absolutely the case uh, that there is there's a, a ludicrous correlation, right? Incredible correlation between depression, anxiety, uh, mental illness, emotional problems, especially among uh, founders, mm-hmm. uh, founders of companies, and getting less than seven and a half hours of sleep a night mm-hmm. on average. And it gets worse and worse the the less and less sleep that you get. And unfortunately, especially in the you know high tech software startup world. Many, many folks, I think this is changing a little bit culturally now, but many, many folks for you know two decades wore their lack of sleep as a badge of honor. Yeah, lawyers too, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and that is, that is truly dangerous. So if you think about what suffers the most when you don't get enough sleep or you know, when you're not healthy in general, sleep being the most important one, but, uh, but others, the thing that scientists can sort of very clearly prove, you know, causal, not just correlation, is poor decision making, mm-hmm. right? Your decision making suffers. If you're asked uh, simple or relatively complex questions, uh, your ability to process information, take it in, come out with the, the right answer or a good outcome diminishes dramatically the less sleep that you get. And what the heck is a founder's job? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's to make good decisions. Yeah. That's that's really the only thing that you have to be great at is making good decisions. Being good at the the work itself, yeah, that matters somewhat, right? And, <laughs> and working hard, okay. That'll that'll help you, but if you're working hard toward the wrong thing, you've made the wrong decision. Whew. My friends, it's not going to go well, right? You you can work a hundred hours a week for years, and if you have you know set yourself in the wrong direction, you would have been better off you know uh, working twenty hours a week in the right direction. Yeah, hard work is not smart work, and I think as a founder, this is this is more true than any other role, and this is certainly something that all of us can take away from you know the startup world is. There's a lot of people burning those midnight oils without anything to show for it. Yeah. So just, I mean, taking care of yourself is pretty fundamental. Sleep, exercise, that, yeah, good food. That is more <laughs> important than almost anything you do in your business and will directly impact how things go. So if, if you think to yourself, gosh, I should take on 
whatever, you know, I should take on this extra project. It'll help the firm or I should take on this extra work. I should do all these things. Mm, (laughs) Maybe you should also think about, Hey, can I get enough sleep? Mm -hmm. Right. If I can get enough sleep and I can do my exercises in the morning when I wake up and I can eat relatively healthy, man, your, your (laughs) decision-making is likely to benefit dramatically. And I mean, you know, not to belabor the point, you are probably going to be a much happier, more productive person. Fundamentally, you'll probably be much happier with your business and your life than if you go to the other extreme. Yeah. So you left Moz, you wrote Lost and Founder, and then you founded SparkToro, which, as we sort of alluded to, is still in beta. But what is SparkToro going to do that's different from what you're doing before? Or just what is SparkToro going to do? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so very different from what I was doing before. So Spark Toro is also in the world of marketing, uh, but it's a it's a tool for audience intelligence. Essentially, my co-founder Casey and I came to this realization that that there's a fundamentally really tough problem in the customer research and uh, sort of marketing targeting world mm-hmm. where, you know, a ton of marketers, especially in the web marketing world, have kind of thrown in the towel on figuring out where they can go reach their audience. And they just spend a bunch of money with Google and Facebook and tell like those two companies to do all the targeting for them. Right. Like I, I can't figure out where my audience engages. I can't figure out what's going to work for them you know what, here, you take all the money, you figure it out. Hmm. And that duopoly, you know, we think is both more expensive and suboptimal for a ton of folks. And so what we wanted to do was take the lengthy, expensive, frustrating process of surveying your customers and asking them, hey, what do you read? What do you watch? What do you listen to? Uh, Who do you follow? What do you pay attention to? You know, what publications do you subscribe to and where do you, you know, which YouTube channels uh, do you watch? What podcasts do you listen to? Uh, what conferences and events do you go to? All of that stuff is hard to get at. Yeah. Right? That's really difficult information to acquire. But in the era of public uh, social and web sharing, it's also available. Yeah. Right. It's on the web. If you were to, you know, for, for lack of a better word, right, if you were to cyber stock 500 of your potential customers, you would get a pretty darn good sense of what they engage with, right? You go visit their whatever, their LinkedIn and their Twitter and their, if they have a public Facebook page and, you know, you go visit their websites, uh, you go visit their uh, uh, Instagram page, right? Their YouTube profile. And you're sort of like, oh, okay, I see what, what's popular in this world. And that's essentially what SparkToro does. It just crawls a bunch of public web pages like Google does. And then it aggregates up these profiles uh, we don't use any personally identifiable information, so we're you know we're not keeping people's names or you know anything associatable with them. We're just saying, oh, here's thirty thousand people who describe themselves as attorneys in the United States, and now let's look at what they, which YouTube channels are most popular with them. Yep. Right. Here's mm-hmm. a YouTube channel that's followed by. Uh, you know, 1,500 of them, that's, you know, whatever, 5%, uh, we're going to we're gonna put that on the list. And so you can very quickly sort of with a lot of accuracy uh, and high statistical sample size, you can query any audience uh, with any geography that we have data on and, and we can tell you, yeah, interior decorators in London listen to these podcasts and they read these websites. People who are interested in conservative politics in Texas tend to read these publications and follow these people on Twitter. People who describe themselves as snowboarders, you know, watch these YouTube channels and uh, listen to these podcasts, right? Sort of like democratized market research? Democratized market research, yeah. Of a very particular kind, but yes. Yeah. I guess one of the things that struck me when I was reading about SparkToro and talking to Aaron about it and thinking about Moz is SEO is really all about getting attention. And then I think it, it feels like SparkToro is the other end. You're trying to figure out where the attention already is so that you can just go there instead of... And and it's not that those two things are opposites or mutually exclusive, but they're kind of different things. And maybe it's quality versus quantity, or or maybe they're just different ends of the marketing spectrum. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, the way way we sort of think about it is uh, SEO is great when someone has expressed their intent already, right? Mm -hmm. If someone goes to Google and they say, I want this thing and I want it right now, great. But what if no one knows about your product? Mm-hmm. Right. What if no one knows that they should be interested in your product? Then 
hey, different kind of story, right? You need to reach them with marketing and advertising and messaging in a different way because they're not searching for the thing you have to offer. You've got to get in front of them. Yeah, it really resonates with me because like lawyers are kind of obsessed with the moment of lawyer shopping, right? Like Mm -hmm. Arizona divorce lawyer, which works if someone's shopping for a lawyer, right. but if your market is married people or, or even easier, like <laughs> I had a friend who represented people with workers' comp claims against railroads. Okay. And so yeah. all his clients were all members of railroad unions. And so the question there is not somebody shopping for a lawyer. It's where are people who are members of railroad unions spending their time in the months and years yeah. before they get injured? so that they already know who you are at the time. Yeah, that's the real game, I think. Yeah, you know, that's exactly the kind of thing that SparkToro would help with, right? So you could plug in the name of the railroad union and you could see, okay, people who mention this railroad union tend to follow, read, watch, listen to these people in publications and you could reach them that way. When you when you see those, you know, like, a, hey, we're looking for people to join a class action lawsuit, for example, right? Have you right. had experience with X or Y or Z? Did you buy from this company? Did you rent from this landlord? Whatever, right? That's the kind of thing SparkToro could help you identify as opposed to, yeah, Arizona divorce attorney. I mean, I think that, you know, SparkToro is much less helpful for those types of situations because advertising That's classic to all, SEO, really? Right, right. Advertising to all people who are married who might get divorced is very tough. Nobody puts in their profile, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I'm considering a divorce in the next few years. <laughs> no. Yeah, but they're probably looking for, say, how do I stay together? And that might be something where a tool like SparkToro could help. Okay, so if people who are looking for a relationship advice, where are they spending their time? Yeah. Now we're on to something. Yeah, yeah, right? So yeah, if someone basically describes themselves in their sort of bio, or they are following, reading, sharing content, talking about a topic in a particular way online, publicly then SparkToro can help you find them, right? We're good in those cases, in cases where people are less forthcoming about Mm -hmm. what they're doing, or (laughs) it's just very subtle, or that that information is sort of hidden until the moment of intent, SEO is a better way to go. Yeah, it's kind of like SEO is the, well, I guess we've said it ad nauseum, but like that is the the end of the stage where people are actually shopping for a solution, looking for something. And you say that in terms of search intent, and which is maybe a term of art that is worth explaining. What do you mean by that? So search intent is essentially when someone types these words and phrases into Google, what goals do they have? Mm-hmm. Why are they doing it, right? I, can we read their mind at that point, basically? Yeah. And the answer is sometimes, mm-hmm. right? Sometimes you can read their mind. When someone searches for Arizona divorce attorney, there's really only one reason they're doing that. You know, maybe a couple, right? They're either, uh, you know, maybe we could imagine a few scenarios, but they're either looking for a divorce or uh, maybe they are someone from the press and they're looking for a quote from someone on statistics that they're going to, you know, put in the paper tomorrow. Those, you know, there's not a whole lot of options. But if somebody searches for anti-competitive practices um, and antitrust law, Mm. Gosh, what are, of, what yeah, are that's they not looking helpful. for? <laughs> right? But, well, it could be, right? It could be really helpful. Maybe this is someone who is about to, uh, who wants to sue Google, mm-hmm. right, for anti-competitive practices. And by ranking for those terms and phrases, if your firm, your practice could attract that person, you might be able to have an extraordinary client on your hands. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got to get into the searcher's mindset, understand what they're looking for, deliver that information in a useful way, impress them, right? Hopefully blow them away, hopefully get lots of other publications from around the web to recognize the work that you've put into this document, this resource, and get them to link to it. Yeah. You know, there's a considerable amount of work that goes into that process. It feels like SparkToro might be a piece of the puzzle that I've been trying to figure out for a while, which is when we... You know, we, we've had pages that optimize really well for things that we don't care about. Yeah, you know, sure. like one of our most popular posts has been about professional handbags, which is, is a, it's a good post. There are lots of good options on there, but the Venn diagram of people who find that post and people who are solo and small firm leaders is probably not that huge. And I know this because I've met yeah. people who've used that to shop for handbags who aren't even lawyers. So, yeah, so, sure, of course. Right. But like when I talk to SEOs about this, they get really excited about how well optimized that page is. 
and we're considering yeah. deleting it because it doesn't actually give our site much benefit because it's not helping us find the people that we are trying to bring into our community. By the same token, like there are blogs out there who write about legal stuff that get really excited about links from the New York Times. And yes. that might carry good link juice, but if a million people visit our site who are not our core audience, that's great, but I don't actually care about most of them because they're not the ones we're trying to help. So this is why I think fundamentally, this is why you should care about that, right? <laughs> if, if you are mentioned in the New York Times, even if it brings you zero visitors who convert over the next 10 years, right? None of them convert. None of them even refer someone to you, mm -hmm. right? What you think to yourself is, oh, that was you know, $2.80 of wasted internet bandwidth, <laughs> right? Because bandwidth is very cheap these days. Yes. I would still tell you that that is a very useful, high quality reference point. And here's why. When people perform search queries that are for exactly what you offer, mm -hmm. right? Whether that's, you know, Arizona divorce attorney, a link and a mention of your brand in the New York Times is a signal of authority and trust and quality that Google will take into consideration, right? right? And so essentially, you know, I, I think you, you kind of refer to it as, as link juice, but, <laughs> but I, would, I would sort of call that the, the, the trust signal, right? Mm -hmm. That is a, a signal of trust. And if you appear in the New York Times and the Washington Post and on CNN.com and on, you know, a bunch of other websites and whatever, right? The, the ABA links to you and maybe the lawyerist podcast links to you because you had a particularly excellent guest appearance, right? And all, <laughs> all these different publications, right, are saying, are, are saying something about you, mentioning you and your brand name, linking to your website. As Google crawls and indexes the internet, they start to pick up on that and you are far more likely to rank than your competitor. Yep. And you might say, well, this is ridiculous. I wrote a piece on professional handbags and so Google thinks I'm a better lawyer? <laughs> Possibly. Yeah, kind of. Possibly, right? Because because you have earned these these signals. And so I think that it is good to keep in mind how Google works mm -hmm. as you are considering these, you know, different marketing investments that you could make because what you think of as useless traffic might in fact be the thing that brings in you know, the next 10 whales that you land. That makes good sense. I want to be respectful of your time, Rand, and I really appreciate the time you spent with us today. We'll be linking to Whiteboard Fridays, to Lost and Founder, and to Spark Toro in the show notes if people want to go there. And if people want to follow you, they can find you where? Where's the best place to send people who want to follow you on the internet? Yeah, so uh, obviously, you know, sparktoro.com is where I'm doing the majority of my work these days. Mm -hmm. If you are on Twitter, I am at Randfish. That's my most active social network. I talk a lot about about web marketing things, including stuff related to Google and small business marketing as well. Very cool. And I really appreciate you having me on, Sam. It's yeah. been great. Thanks, friend. Are you interested in implementing the ideas you've heard on today's podcast into your law firm? Could you use a little help? Hey, guys, it's Stephanie, the VP of Community Success here at Lawyers, and I'd love to help you tackle your business or take it to the next level. Head over to go.lawyerist.com backslash start to sign up for a quick call with me. And let's talk about how Lawyerist can help you create your best law firm. Make sure to catch next week's episode of the Lawyerist podcast by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast app. And please leave a rating to help other people find our show. You can find the notes for today's episode on lawyerist.com slash podcast. The Lawyerist podcast is produced with help from Lindsay Calhoun and edited by Paul Fisher. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you. Mm -hmm.